Hello, everyone. How's it going? All right, so my name is Mark, and I'm here today to tell you about one of my favorite things in the world, the avocado. Who here likes avocados? Yes. Easy sell on this crowd. So it's true, guilty as charged, I am a millennial. Um, people keep telling me that my love of avocado toast is the reason why I don't have a house. Uh, it's entirely possible. Um, I haven't seen houses on the menu at Mezzarine yet, but I'm sure it's a, some sort of special that's coming soon. Uh, but in all seriousness, um, as I was researching the avocado, I realized that there is a creature that has a much closer kinship to the avocado than even us millennials, and that is the giant ground sloth. So before we get there, let's talk about what an avocado is. So an avocado is the fruit of this tree, the Persea, the Persea Americana tree. It's part of the laurel family, for you tree fans out there. And it's native to Central America. It also appears a little bit in Northwestern uh, South America. And the word avocado comes from the Nahuatl language, which is one of the indigenous language of the Aztec people. Um, it was originally thought that Awakatl is uh, Nahuatl for testicle. <laughs> but current linguists actually think the causality goes in the opposite direction, that the primary meaning of Awakatl was the avocado, and the anatomical part was slang, similar to how we use the word nuts in English. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, Nahuatl is the same language where, we, where the word chocolate is derived from. So basically, it's responsible for my entire diet. And, you know, these two American ecologists, Paul S. Martin on the left and Dan Jansen on the right, were studying the avocado in the late 70s. Uh, side note, these people are actually both the same age. Pro tip for any scientists in the audience, if you make a major discovery, make sure the only Creative Commons pictures of you online are when you're younger. And it'll really work out for you like that. But in any case, uh, so in the late 70s, they were exploring the avocado's natural habitat uh, in a natural preserve in Costa Rica. So as you can imagine, most avocados uh, in the world today are on farms, are cultivated. So, so they wanted to see what avocados are like in the wild, and what they found startled them. And I'm sure it will startle you too. All the avocados were rotting on the ground. Now, I know. I'm glad all of you think this is a major tragedy. You know, I did as well. Um, and if you thought it was a tragedy, you know, Dan Jansen thought it was an even bigger tragedy. As an ecologist, he knows that you know, the way the avocado tree is supposed to reproduce is these seeds need to spread. They need to get away from the tree. And in fact, you know, if you look at other fruits, um, I, did not, I, I, not actually, I falsely believed before researching this talk that the purpose of you know, the fleshy part of a fruit was to give the seed nutrients as it grew into uh, the plant, but that's actually, uh, most biologists now believe is false. The purpose of a fruit is to attract animals who will eat the fleshy part of the fruit and therefore carry the seeds somewhere else. And this was evidently not happening in the avocado's natural habitat in Costa Rica. So let's talk a little bit about dispersal syndromes, which is the fancy term for how fruits spread their seeds. Um, there's many different types of syndromes, and the exact type of syndrome has a big influence on actually how the plant, uh, uh, how the plant is shaped. So you have wind dispersal uh, syndrome, like dandelions here. Uh, these are meant to allow seeds to float. They generally have no fruit at all. Uh, uh, they just float on the wind. Uh, you also have ant dispersal syndrome. So this, these are ants with the African mahogany seed. They usually have a tiny packet of little lipid-rich food right on the outside of the seed that the, that's very easily accessible for the ants so that they can carry the seed back to their colony and therefore spread the seed. You have avian dispersal syndrome. So these are mostly small berries. The fruits are usually very small, easily eaten by birds. They have a very thin protective layer of skin, no tough rinds or anything, and they're often brightly colored because you know, uh, most birds uh, use vision. Um, lastly, you have mammal, mammalian dispersal syndrome. These fruits are usually much bigger than bird fruit. They sometimes have a much tougher rind, which mammals can open up, um, and they much more often use smells as opposed to bright colors. So of these three fruit categories, avocados seem to most naturally fit into the mammals. You know, they're large, they're not so brightly colored, you know, they have rinds, but there's a problem. So if I had got, <laughs> if I were to get this avocado in the store, I'd be pretty fucking pissed off. 
But actually, this is much, yeah, this is much closer to what an actual natural avocado looks like. You know, human beings have cultivated the fleshy part to be a much bigger part of the fruit over many years. Um, and so most of the avocado is this giant pit. Um, and this giant pit, you know, from the perspective of the avocado, well, in, in one evolutionary sense, it's really good. You know, most of the nutrients for the burgeoning tree come from inside the pit. So the bigger the pit, the more nutrients you can have, the bigger you can grow. But, you know, if this uh, pit is too big, animals won't be able to spread you around. So take a look at this guy. <laughs> there are lots of, oops, let's try and hit play here. Yes. So there are lots of animals in nature that like eating avocados, and we might think this is, this is great, but from the avocado's perspective, this guy's a fucking moocher. He's only eating the fleshy part. He's not taking the seed anywhere. Um, there are some animals, like you know, cows, for example, which are large enough that they can swallow the avocado whole. Cows have very big molars, though. They tend to crush the pit, which is really bad because of this chemical called persin. It is heavily present within the seed. It causes uh, myocardial damage. It basically means it eats away at the heart. It's known to cause death in birds and rabbits and extreme nausea in cats and dogs. I do not recommend putting this on your toast at all. So with this toxic seed, um, how are these seeds actually being spread around? So Janderson was really thinking about this. In 1977, he was puzzling over what he called the riddle of the rotting fruit. Um, and then he had an epiphany when he was observing, you know, uh, the wilds of Costa Rica. Um, and there are many great moments of science. All of you probably know the probably a yes. All of you probably know the apocryphal story of Newton watching the apple fall from the tree. Um, probably not true, so I think this is an even much more monumental story where one day in 1977 in Costa Rica, Dan Jansen was inspired by a crescentia seed on top of a big pile of horseshit. <laughs> so crescentia is a very large fruit, can often be as big as a soccer ball. Um, so this is an indication, you know, to Jansen that crescentia seeds could actually be dispersed, you know, by horses. Now, now what's so special about horses compared to cattle? Well, because horses... Most of you think of horses as like an old world animal, but contemporary scientists now believe that horses evolved in the new world, crossed over the Bering Land Bridge, were hunted to extinction, and then reintroduced into the new world after colonization. So in the uh, Pleistocene era, which is to say the era up through the end of what we colloquially call the last ice age, up to about 11,000 years ago, uh, horses were just one of several megafauna that existed in North America. Um, and perhaps these could actually or s spread the avocados. Now, horses themselves couldn't have been the uh, animal that were spreading avocado seeds um, because they chew the seeds a little bit too much. Uh, avocados are going to be extremely toxic to horses. Um, I uncovered this online when I was researching this talk. I found a lot of horse people forums where people are talking about poisoning their poor horses with avocado toast. It's, it's, not, it's not good. Anyway, so... <laughs> There are two animals in particular which Jansen thought would likely qualify. First is the gomphotheres. Uh, these are related but not identical to what we think of as contemporary elephants. Um, they have these four very large tusks. Um, they are quite large. But the main animal that Jansen focused on was the megatherium, also known as the giant ground sloth. Yes. Got some sloth fans in the audience. Great. Um, so the megatherium is endemic to South America and Central America, too. These guys are really large. I don't know if you've ever seen a skeleton of them at one of the museums around here, but they generally were about four tons. Uh, they're about six, uh, six meters in length from head to, ta for he from head to tail. Um, they were pretty much larger than any land mammal now. Um, the woolly mammoths of the past were thought to be a little bit larger. Um, and very crucially, uh, the shape of their teeth, according to Jansen, uh, would let them pry avocados from the tree uh, without necessarily chewing and grinding on their core too much. They wouldn't get poisoned uh, by the avocado core. So it's thought that despite being very large, you know, these uh, giant ground sloths could actually stand up, stand up on their hind legs and pluck the avocados off of trees. This is really valuable because, as I'm sure all of you know, avocados go bad really quickly. It's like... Um, so... Um, but there's not a great way of like testing theories, you know, about the ancient world like this. Um, but you know, Martin N. Chamba in uh, Cameroon in 1993 uh, decided to test this theory through elephants, uh, which are kind of analogous to uh, Pleistocene gomphotheres, and the closest we have in terms of raw size uh, to uh, 
uh, to giant ground sloths. And, you know, avocados uh, are not really endemic to Africa, but, you know, they grow pretty much everywhere. So by planting a bunch of avocado trees in uh, Cameroon in the early 90s, Chambu was able to catalog all of the elephants that ate, uh, that ate avocados. Uh, he was able to track them and basically... Uh, basically sort through their dung after they excreted it, because science is really glamorous like that. And he was able to find that, yes, the full avocado pits were able to survive the digestive tract of the modern elephant. And so therefore, this led it, lent some credence to the theory that the megafauna of the Pleistocene era were what were responsible for spreading the avocado around. So there's a lot of interesting implications to this. Um, a lot of the, you know, design, well, not exactly design, but a lot of the way avocados are structured, um, really, it's, it only is the way it is because it was extremely well adapted to these megafauna. They have an extremely toxic seed, which can't be chewed, which basically scares other animals away from consuming it. Uh, it was, the fleshy part is relatively high in fat content, which works really well with giant ground sloths and other large mammals. Um, the very large seed was a good adaptation because it allowed it to, you know, uh, spread very well and have lots of nutrients. Um, but really, you know, the avocado is now missing its partner. You can think of this fruit as a sort of monument to a creature, you know, that no longer exists. And why doesn't it exist? Well, the contemporary theory also actually worked on, you know, by Jansen, is that, you know, these uh, giant ground sloths went extinct about 11,000 years ago, uh, which is very coincidentally about when humans crossed the Bering Land Bridge into the Americas. Um, they also lasted a little bit longer on some Caribbean islands, uh, which were also settled by, you know, Native Americans a little bit later. So the consensus is that humans hunted these ground sloths to extinction. Uh, much like the dodo, these, you know, are very large animals, um, very easily hunted down, very easily for humans, you know, to take down. Um, so in a way, you know, this, I feel real affinity to these ground sloths. Like, we both like avocados. <laughs> You know, we both have a reputation for being a little bit lazy uh, as a millennial, but, you know, the slowness of sloths, sloths are really well adapted to the Pleistocene era. Their large size uh, made it so that, you know, they didn't have a lot of natural predators where human beings came along, um, and they're extremely metabolically efficient being so large. And so I think of both, you know, millennials and giant ground sloths as having this bad reputation for being lazy, but essentially we're both the victims of humanity's, you know, insatiable drive to consume more and more resources. So with that, I would like to you know, raise my glass to the giant ground sloth. I'd, li I'd like us all to think about the giant ground sloth a little the next time we enjoy our avocado toast. And you know, the giant ground sloth, you know, even though it's not with us anymore, it really helped shape something that other creatures get to enjoy you know, thousands of years after it left. And I think that's the best any of us can hope for. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs> Okay, so Mark, this was your third talk. Will you join us in the order of the Wolpertinger as a fellow? I would be delighted. <laughs>